Welcome everyone to another edition of Kiwi Talks and Happy New Year. I'm honored to be speaking to one of the greatest composers of all time. You might know him specifically wow. for Halo. <laughs> Marty O'Donnell, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Reese. Thanks. And uh, thanks for the compliments. I appreciate that. That's all right. That's as all right. as a game composer, it's it's uh it's interesting to hear someone think of you as a you know, a great composer just as a composer. So I appreciate that. I really do. Well, you are often mentioned in, in goat conversations when people talk about <laughs> top top five composers or top 10 composers, you're always in there, right? Well, I hope that's great. I, I don't necessarily get into those conversations, so I don't know <laughs> how that happens. So that's great. Because how long did it take you before you became aware of how much of an impact your score for Halo became? Um, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I knew that, that, uh, the, the score itself had a lot of power and right from the beginning, right. Even in 1999, when we first showed at Macworld in New York, um, with Steve jobs presenting, uh, I could tell that the music had a big impact on people's interest in the game that hadn't been released yet. Um, I was hoping I could keep that sort of interest and excitement from the music going. And then after we released the music and, or the, the game, and then uh, Niall Rogers contacted me to release the soundtrack, uh, I thought, okay, this is really good. Um, but I didn't think of it having any sort of long-term impact until pretty much the last couple of years where I get these you know, 21, 22 year old people coming up to me saying, oh, you're the soundtrack of my childhood. And I grew up listening to your music and your music has so much impact on my life. And I'm like, oh, there's a whole next generation of, of people who are now becoming adults who were very impacted by the music. And, and that, you know, most of the time, if, you, if you're doing a video game or a TV show or whatever it is, it has a life and then it goes away. So to see it actually have fans that are next generation, um, it's pretty satisfying. And that, that's the thing that really let me know that there was some long-term impact to the music. Yeah, well, particularly with Halo, because it's considered one of the, the greatest first-person shooters of all time. Master Chief is an icon. Yeah. And you go to any convention and someone's dressed up as him. So, I mean, have you gone to any of those conventions? Um, I go to, I've been to PAX oh, right. and then I've been, you know, game developers conference, which is not really a fan convention. I was at, um, I went to Comic-Con in San Diego a few years ago and, uh, because I was conducting one of the pieces from destiny there. And that was really fun to see all the fans at Comic-Con and how crazy that atmosphere is. But the actual like Halo kind of conventions, I, I haven't been to any of those yet. I, that, that would be fun. I would love to do that. Mm. So give me a breakdown of how you actually go about composing, right? Do you sit there and just think of a melody and then play it? Or do you jam on your keys first? Like what, what is your method? Or do you have multiple methods? I, I do have multiple methods. Uh, I would say because I, I started out as a pianist and a keyboard player, um, uh, I'm probably most comfortable when I have a blank sheet of music paper in front of me, or I, I haven't had any ideas yet. I'm most comfortable just going to the piano and, and, you know, playing and improvising and seeing what comes out of that. But there have been a couple of times where I've been pretty successful driving in my car and thinking of melodies. Um, and so, for example, the Halo Monk melody came when I was driving in my car. Uh, coming over to the studio and I was desperate. I knew we had to have something and I, I needed to walk in with something we could start with. And the monk melody is the first thing I worked on. And I did that away from a keyboard. I did that in my car. So. All right. Do you tend to find that you work better under deadlines? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that's, seems to be... uh, that's the secret to my success is I always say when people say, you know, what, what, what's your inspiration? I say deadlines. Um, <laughs> Deadlines get me off my butt and make me finally do something. Uh, I really, and this is just me. I'm, I'm sure there are other composers who are way more disciplined. Uh, I really have a problem just 
having free time and saying, oh, well, I think I'm just going to go, you know, run down and write a symphony. I just, somebody's got to give me assignments. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I watch TV <laughs> or play video games. Well, uh, to be honest, I mean, I've spoken to a number of composers and they seem to echo what you're saying that they don't okay. seem, yeah, that they, they need deadlines as well. Otherwise, I mean, I was just spe speaking to uh, the WWE composer, Jim Johnston, um, last year and he was saying that he'd get all these ideas and then he'd end up not finishing one and start on another one and then ended up starting on another one because he didn't have any um after he got fired from wwe that he didn't have any deadlines anymore so he actually found it hard so yeah it's so i wouldn't worry about it yeah good, good. yeah yeah i think i think a lot of composers are the same that's why i asked do you ever get writer's block oh yeah sure i i there are times when I think, well, that's it. That, my best days are behind me. I'll never have another decent idea. It's over. Uh, I've gone to the well too many times. Uh, uh, yeah, I have all those kinds of things that happen. And then something helps me break through, whether it's, you know, taking a drive, going, uh, you know, distracting myself or just sitting at the keyboard and pounding away, or even sometimes listening to other music and just trying to clear my mind. Uh, the deadlines tend to help. Uh, the deadline tends to say, you know, we don't care about your doubts and we don't care about your uh, block. You just got to get this done. So, but yeah, yeah I, 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 I don't think I've had writer's block that's lasted very long. I don't know what that might be like. It would be pretty scary if it happened for a long period of time, protracted. But, you know, there, yeah, there are a couple of days in a row where I'm just like, yeah, this is, I got nothing. So that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And when it does, I mean, your mind plays tricks on you, right? Oh yeah. 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 That's why I, I prefer if, if I can feel myself in that space, then I, I do go do something else and try to completely get my mind off of it. Otherwise you sort of lock into that block and you, you're not going to get through it. Yeah. You probably can't answer this, but I'll, I'll ask anyway, but um, have you been approached or actually, even if you were approached, would you be open to doing it? Would you, compose a remix if master chief ended up in smash brothers <laughs> um i'd love to be asked isn't master chief in something he's in some sort of brawler uh master chief shows up in different things i, I mean, he hasn't i don't think he has showed up in or has he has he shown up at Smash Brothers? Probably no, not. No, no, he hasn't. But I mean, given the new one that's out and how big it is, and now, you know, they've got Steve from Minecraft and Banjo Kazooie now, and Microsoft and Nintendo seem to be buddy buddy, as yeah. much as co uh, competitors can be buddy buddy. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, the, it, it seems only natural that Master Chief will end up in in it at some point. Well, that'd be great. I um, it's. It, it, I haven't been asked by Microsoft to do anything <laughs> in the last decade or so. So um, I'd be surprised because Microsoft, of course, still owns the IP and um, they, they, for some reason, have not asked me to do anything. So I'd be surprised if they asked me, but if Nintendo asked me, that'd be great. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I can take a snippet of this and <laughs> plaster it everywhere. And there see you what go. Happens. Okay. <laughs> what was the What was the evolution like of working with Bungie? So from the from the early days right up until the end, did right. the did the <laughs> did the atmosphere change at all within Bungie, oh, or was it yeah, more huge? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've talked about this in some other uh, interviews, but I mean, when I started with them, it was, I, I met them in 1996. Uh, they were basically a small little company on the South side of Chicago. And they, they sort of ran their company like a dorm room. They were all in their twenties, early twenties. Um, I was much older, already had a couple of kids, had an established business in, in the, in downtown Chicago. Um, I, I enjoyed working with them, but it was, it was sort of a risky uh, endeavor for, for my little company to, to not be working for advertising agencies or well-known producers, but to work for this little scrappy video game company. But it was fun. So it was a very much a, uh, 
you know, little engine that could kind of attitude and a small crew of people, maybe about 26, 30 people total. Um, and then it, it started getting more successful. And by 2000, it was bought by Microsoft. And then they moved everybody out to Redmond and the Pacific Northwest here in the States. Uh, I would say our attitude didn't become corporate, but we were definitely owned by the man. Uh, Microsoft brought, you know, it's certainly Microsoft brought discipline and, you know, order and of course deep pockets. So just about anything we could think of doing, we were going to get funded, which was very cool. Um, but then as more and more success over the next decade and we spun out and became independent again, uh, Bungie just grew, grew, grew. And by 20, you know, 13, um, it felt like a completely different company to me. A lot of the original people that I knew were gone. Um, we were pushing 650, 700 employees total. It just, things had just radically, radically changed. And uh, as far as I can tell, it's changed even more since then. So in the last six, seven years, it's, it's very different than what I remember. So uh, I, I think of my time at Bungie, the way I like to look at it is sort of like Camelot. It felt like a very magical time. And that time is over, certainly for me and some of my friends who were at Bungie at the time. So does, I don't does, know what it's like there now. But does the bigger a company get, does the more politicking end up being involved? And particularly, I mean, I think of it, there's similarities, I think, between the, the game industry and, say, the film industry, where you might have, say, a director, uh, and then the, the film or the studio constantly interferes. Was that becoming a thing towards the end? Well... You know, when Bungie was completely independent in Chicago, nobody interfered. So that was a lot of fun. And then of when course. we got inside of Microsoft, it was our goal to not let Microsoft interfere. And for some reason, I didn't sort of see it at the time because I was part of that struggle to prevent the corporate heads and the suits at Microsoft from, you know, trying to affect what we were doing. So I was part of that fight. And what was nice is that we won that fight almost all the time. We were able to stay independent of, and, and it was never a mean thing. They, you know, they peri periodically we would hear from the, you know, the suits at Microsoft, what they wished we could do or what, what they wanted us to do. And we would just not do it. Or we would tell them why we, our ideas were better. Um, what would they, what would they tell you to do? Like, what, what well, they, the a lot that... of times it was, you know, it was like, well, certainly, you guys need to, you know, finish the game in 18 months rather than three years. <laughs> so, and we would just say, that's impossible. We can't, the game won't be good unless we get to finish it. And we still had to crunch. So it took us three years almost for every game that we did. Halo 1, 2001, Halo 3, uh, Halo 2 was 2004. Uh, Halo 3 was 2007. So it, it was three, it took us three years to make these games. Um, I would have loved to finish the game in 18 months. If there, if there was a way to do that, uh, that would have been great. Uh, it just didn't seem like it was possible the way we made games. So anything that they tried to get us to do, they would throw producers at us. They would try to get us scheduled a certain way. Um, they just didn't ever seem to understand the creative process. I just don't think it's in Microsoft's DNA to truly understand what it's like to go from nothing to something and be creative. Um, so all of our discussions and arguments with them were based on that kind of misunderstanding. And it, I don't really blame them. They're business people. They, you know, they know how to make software. They know how to put schedules together and get things out on time and hit the fiscal year and do all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, it just, we were able to say, that's just not going to work. Um, and they, they accepted it. I think our success, our success helped them accept the way we did stuff, which was mm -hmm. great. Um, 
the funny thing to me is when we became independent and we had a um, relationship with Activision, Activision, who didn't own the uh, Destiny intellectual property, the Activision wasn't, we didn't allow them to own the property. They were just going to be our publisher. Um, I was on the board at the time with Bungie and I thought, well, this is the ideal situation. We have deep pockets, but no pressure because they don't own the IP. So we can just do what we think is right. And they somehow, maybe it was the personalities involved or the politics, like you say, or maybe just the amount of money that was involved. Uh, in my opinion, Activision got to have um, way too much influence over our process. And that was the beginning of the end for me because I, I argued that that was bad and that was wrong for us. And we shouldn't let Activision influence our process. And I, I remember at one point saying, you know, when we were wholly owned by Microsoft, we, we acted more like we were independent and owned our own IP than we actually do now that we are independent and own our, our own IP. Um, but, you know, nobody listened to me. <laughs> I sometimes I wonder if it's out. better. I sometimes it would think it would be better if kind of the game developers end up becoming the people in the suits because they have a fundamental understanding of game design and how it works and how much time it takes, as opposed to just having a business person or having yeah. someone that can kind of do both. But it seems like that's very rarely the case. Yeah. You know, there have been attempts, uh, I mean, gathering of developers or been, there are other creative developers who have thought, gee, if only we could just be in, totally in charge, it would be better. I, I haven't seen that be a super successful thing. There, there does have to be some sort of discipline and, and business considerations in order for you to finally ship. It's a little bit like the deadlines thing where mm. if you don't have deadlines, if you don't have like something you need to get out and sell, otherwise you can't eat. Like if you don't need, if you don't have some of that pressure, um, you tend just to sort of spin out and never complete anything. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the magic formula is. I don't know. It's interesting to me that in hindsight, I look back and I kind of feel like the situation we had with Microsoft was close to. I I can't believe I'm saying this, but it was close to ideal because they sort of realized that they really didn't have control over us, but they were willing to continue to fund us, even though it kind of ticked them off. Um, and to a certain extent, I think they could put pressure on us, but they couldn't force us for some reason. Um, so I, when I look back, I just say, hey, some of the best work I ever did and, and Bungie ever did, in my opinion, happened while we were wholly owned by Microsoft, which it's taken me probably 10 years to see that. <laughs> well, hindsight's um, always 20, 20 yes, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But I kind of feel Halo was kind of Microsoft's golden goose, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. as a result of that, they, in a way, maybe wanted to give you more space because they saw how successful you had made the franchise. Well, how you big know, it, I, it become. Or became, I, I use the, the goose as a metaphor. Um, and the way I look at it is that the important thing is, is the golden egg. And Halo was the golden egg. But you can't be nice to a golden egg and get more golden eggs. You have to be nice to the goose in order to get more golden eggs. And the, the goose actually isn't golden. You, you look at a goose and it looks like every other goose. So you pay attention to the eggs it lays. And we... You know, I remember saying this exact metaphor to Phil Spencer, and I think he agreed. He agreed that, like, he was, he and other officials, you know, other suits over at uh, Microsoft were kind of going to be as nice as they could be to the goose to see if they could get more golden eggs. Um, not everybody, not all the business people in the world actually see that. They, they tend to look at the eggs and just think they can get somebody else to crank out the same eggs. And what's the magic part is actually the goose that lays the eggs. Um, and you never know why that particular goose is actually magic or good. 
There's nothing about the goose that tells you that it's going to do something great. So you just hope it did it before. Maybe it'll do it again. So just be nice to it. That's my yeah. metaphor. <laughs> great, great, great. Be nice metaphor. to the goose. <laughs> Cause were you considered a contractor or were you an actual employee? Cause how does that, uh, how of, does that work? Well, when well, you, I started in 96, I started as a, yeah, I started as a contractor and then I became an employee of, Bun of Bungie in 2000. So I was full-time with Bungie in 2000. And then we almost immediately got bought by Microsoft. Right. And so I was officially, I think I was officially a Bungie employee for 10 days. And then all of a sudden I was a Microsoft employee. <laughs> so that was, that was quite a culture change. But um, Bungie never stopped feeling like it was its own place. And we all felt like we were employees of Bungie, not Microsoft, even though officially we were what they call blue badgers. We all had our blue badge. We were official Microsoft employees. Right. Um, so we didn't become independent again until 2007. And then Bungie was, uh, became its own corporation and we were independent of Microsoft. And then I became another I was one of the employees at Bungie Inc. So right. that was pretty fun. Because I'm unsure exactly how this works because I know it works differently in Australasia. But because when you were fired, did you have any, did you have a heads up? Did you know it was coming or did it just come completely <laughs> left field? Because I know like in, in New Zealand and Australia, you can't do that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. The, um, it's different in America. It's different in America, but uh, I was a, what they call um, at will employee, which means that you can be fired for no reason. It's like, it's, it's up to the company. I can quit at any time and they can fire me at any time. That how oh, that, okay. That's how that works. Um, but I had been having some ongoing disagreements with, I was on the board of directors at Bungie and I was constantly for the last, probably two years that I was there. I was not happy with, like I said before, some of the things that I saw happening that I thought were not good. Um, so it was, I, I feel like I was slowly splitting with the people who I was working with and also Activision. Um, so I, I would say there was a point almost a year before I was fired where I almost just quit um, and got into quite a row with Activision and Bungie uh, leadership. But then we tried to make it work, but that last year was very difficult, uh, somewhat contentious. Uh, we just couldn't seem to make it work. I couldn't make it work. They couldn't make it work. So the last couple of months, um, there were warnings and deadlines and right. like, here's, here's an agreement we want you to sign. And I didn't want to sign it. I didn't like it. And then I went and got lawyers. So uh, the oh, last gosh. month or so was, it, it was already Sounds not good. Messy. It was messy <laughs> and it, it got messier, which is hilarious, but yeah. yeah, it's talking about hindsight. I can look back on all that now and, and see, you know, different ways I could have behaved or different things I could have done, but you know, it is what it is. That's the way it, it worked out. So was there a sigh of relief kind of though? Where it's like, Oh, okay. I don't have to, when, when it all happened, was there a part of you because of how messy it was and how difficult it was that you kind of felt a sense of freedom from that? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it was, it was still pretty shocking. I, I was, you know, I think, people, especially if you're in a position of leadership or influence or you've got a track record, you kind of tend to think, well, I'm immune. <laughs> like they're, <laughs> they're certainly not going to fire me, right? So, yeah. uh, but it was obvious this wasn't going to work out and it was, it was tearing me up. It was, it was not good. So there was a certain amount of relief along with sort of shock and now what do I do? And, um, but I certainly didn't have, I wasn't waking up in the middle of the night stewing over uh, the issues that I had been stewing over. It was nice just to be able to walk away from that and not have to, you know, I, I was pretty sure that the first version of Destiny was 
not going to be, it was not going to live up to the potential, or certainly I didn't think it was going to live up to the hype that we were creating. And that was part of my complaints. And I felt kind of relieved that I didn't have to uh, worry about whether Destiny was great or good or mediocre. I didn't have to worry about it anymore. So mm. that was nice. One of the things I think people forget is obviously you you did some of the you were in charge of some of the dialogue and sound sound design as well. Mm -hmm. but I think yeah. people just tend to focus on you, you as the composer, but there was actually a right. lot of other elements elements that you were involved in. Yeah. How how did you manage to find time to compose, do sound design and dialogue? I mean, Halo's in a way a cinematic game, so you must have recorded thousands and thousands of bits of dialogue, not only in yes. English, but in other languages as well. Well, I didn't have to worry about the uh, localization stuff, although there were, we did get to listen to uh, actors who were from other countries. So we could, we could, I could throw my two cents in, right? I could say, wow, the, the French Cortana doesn't sound right. She's too husky or whatever. I mean, um, sometimes we could help change or we could choose between three or four different voice actors and say that one sounds the best. Um, but the only lines of dialogue that I had to worry about were the English ones. And um, mm, um, yeah, we had literally, I'm sure over the 10 years that I worked on Halo, there was hundreds of thousands of lines of dialogue. It's just unbelievable how much dialogue there was. Uh, some lines being very short, of course, but like there was so much in all those games, uh, thousands and thousands of lines. And, uh, you know, I had a, an audio team that worked with me. I had, uh, you know, Jay Wineland was my audio lead and C. Paul Johnson. And I had help with music from my partner, Mike Salvatore, who was the guy I worked with in Chicago. And Stan Lapard was a composer here in the Pacific Northwest who helped me with recording orchestration and some comp composition. Um, I had a really great team. I could not have done it all just as one person, but I was the audio director. So as the audio director, I felt it was my job to, you know, have a vision for what I thought things should be and make sure it all went together the right way as much as possible. Um, and, I'll take the blame for stuff people don't like, but the team should get the credit for the overall, you know, all the work that was done. So that was my attitude with that. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a big team. There's a lot of people, of course. And of course, then we have the audio programming people, the engineers that have yeah, to, you course. know, come up with the engine and how audio actually works in real time. And there was, there was just a lot of moving parts, but I loved being in charge of all that. And, you know, I wasn't shy about, you know, saying what my opinion was and saying, no, it's got to be this way. You know, I want it this way, make it so. So I feel, you know, I was definitely the captain of the audio ship. Um, and that was a lot of fun. That was cool. Mm. How often would the, the people above you get you to change something that you've written? So say you composed something, you'd present it and they'd be like, no, go change it. Uh, never. They never got me to change something never. I composed. I just found a different place to use it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what I mean by that is like any music that you do, like it, there are times when people would come to me and say, Hey, this doesn't seem right here. And I would go, yeah. You know, or I would ask them why. And they would tell me it has something to do with like, I've used this example before, but I remember Jason Jones, the creative director on Halo. I think it was even just Halo one. He said, Marty, this, this music at the beginning of the swamp, just I wanted it to make me feel tense and scared, but instead I just feel kind of goofy. And I thought, okay, well, that's not what I want you to feel. So I came up with something different for that. But the piece that was, you know, that he thought was goofy, I used someplace else. So <laughs> that's what yeah, I mean by I never changed the actual piece. I would use, I would find some other place to use it. Probably a place where I wanted people to be a little bit more lighthearted because I thought, well, if, Jason felt it was goofy. I'll use it in some goofy spot. So was so, this the but I did I would change, you know, I would work closely with designers and creative directors and art directors. And if they told me that the emotions that they were feeling were really off from what I was intending, I, I took that to heart and and would figure out something else to do. Yeah, because 
in my experience, I'm a creative person as well. And I think sometimes mm-hmm. creative people can be quite sensitive to criticism. Yeah. But in, in your case, I mean, if, if none of your stuff got critiqued to the point like this is terrible or anything, because other composers I've spoken to, you know, they had to change stuff. But if you should get a medal or something if you never had to actually <laughs> change well, anything. Just chuck I, it at a different place. That's actually a brilliant yeah. way of doing it. Yeah, well, I think uh, part of it was the fact that I, when I started working with the guys at Bungie, um, they were probably average 20 years younger than I was. So <laughs> they had this sort of like respect, I think. And, and uh, I could throw around, you know, my professional background and my educational background and sort of act like, well, who are you to question what I think is right? You know, and I, I used that a few times, not too obviously, but um, I preferred keeping them a little bit. Uh, I didn't want them to ever get into the weeds and say, you know, could you use cellos here instead of violas or something like that? And if they ever were to say that kind of detail stuff, I would be like, you know what? You just you guys should do the music. I'm going to go find something else to do. I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll go someplace else. So I think they kind of knew that. Um, I always made it clear that what I really wanted to hear was their emotional response to music that I was using or doing and um, work closely with them to, to the, the most important thing was to give the player, uh, enhance the player's emotional journey through the game. And if I, if I felt like I could do that, um, I was pr- I was pretty successful and the people I were working with were very open to whatever my ideas were. And they, they had a lot of trust, which I really appreciated. So I've never had to go to some creative director and say, here's a bunch of music. What do you think? And then they go, well, I like this and this, I'm rejecting this, this, and this. Um, And I know that happens with a lot of composers today, Mm. uh, but it never happened with me. So I feel good about that. Would you ever do a uh, transition to television or film? Uh, you know, I did film and television in the first part of my career. I did commercials and film and, and some TV stuff out of Chicago. Um, you know, if the right sort of project came along, I would consider it. I People's roles in television and film are so, you know, narrowly defined that I'm not sure I would be happy doing that or I, may, I probably wouldn't even be that successful i don't know uh, it depends on the if a director came to me and we hit it off and and i could work kind of with the freedom that i'm accustomed to i think it would be really great i would love mm-hmm. to do that there was a point in time i remember where uh peter jackson and neil blomkamp were trying to get a halo film off the ground yeah, yeah. yeah. um and obviously it nothing happened with it and they ended up doing district nine but was there any <laughs> But um, did did they ever consult you at any point? Like, was there any part where they're thinking maybe uh, Marty can do the score for the film? Was there any discussions at any point in time, or were you even uh, involved not, in any of that process at all? We we uh, uh, I wasn't directly involved, although Peter Jackson came and visited Bungie Studios. So there's video of oh, wow. me okay. showing Peter Jackson around and and getting to meet Peter, and it was. Um, right around the time I think he was working on King Kong. Um, and then a couple of our, well, a couple of our people went out and stayed in New Zealand at his place and really? talked about scripts. Oh yeah. Yeah. They went way down the road. Um, and the interesting thing is too, uh, very few, few people know this, but, um, I worked with an actor named Ron Perlman. Oh yes. Who, Ron Perlman. Okay. Yeah. And he's, uh, friends he's actually close friends with um uh oh man the name for slipping my head the spanish sci-fi or horror guy um del toro yeah yeah guillermo del toro yeah so he was close friends with guillermo and he i remember i was in a session with ron perlman and he said you know guillermo is talking with peter jackson too and he's a fan of halo and he so the first guy who was going to direct um the Peter Jackson produced Halo was going to be Guillermo del Toro, which was, I was, I thought, well, that'd be really great. And no one knew who Neil Blomkamp was at the time, Hmm. but so there were a couple scripts written for the, uh, um, 
first Halo movie that was going to happen with under Peter Jackson's production company and with Peter Jackson involved. Um, oh, I forget the name of the, there was another famous guy who did, uh, what's it called? 30 days later, no, 15 days later, 10 days later, 20, that 28, zombie days, movie. Later? 28, 28 days, days later. There, there you go. There you go. <laughs> You're close. You're uh, close. Yes. yes. Uh, anyway, the guy who wrote that wrote a treatment for the first Halo movie script, which I still have, which is actually really fun to read. Um, so, yeah, we went way down the path, but there were a lot of reasons why that whole thing fell through. There was going to be a game that Peter Jackson's company was going to make, and our guys were helping to, to confer with him about this game. Really? Okay. Yeah. And... That fell through. The movie sort of fell through. Meanwhile, Neil, Neil Blom, Blomkamp had been brought in. And the only thing that we ended up doing with, from any of that was Neil Blomkamp did a series of short films, which you can still find on, on the mm. web. Yeah. And I spoke to Neil over the phone, and he, you know, it wasn't big budget, but they'd done some really beautiful things with... Uh, some of the uh, props and the warthog that they built in, in New Zealand and all of that stuff was built there and weapons and, you know, armor for the soldiers and master chief, the whole thing was all done. So they did this series of short films and he used a bunch of my music in that, which was great. Um, so that's the only thing the only remnant of that period is like my music is sitting in those Neil Blomkamp films that are really fun to watch uh, that were, I think, used as promotional for Halo 3, maybe? I think it... Yeah, because what was the last one you worked on? Was remember. it Reach? Reach was, Reach was 2010. Yeah, yeah. I just and the mind. Halo, uh, I can't remember if it was, if it was, I don't think it was prior to Reach. I think it was around 2007 that Neil Blomkamp's short films came out. Because District 9 came out in 2009, I think it was. Oh, okay. Well, so, that was the other thing, is that they ended up taking all those props, like the weapons. Like, if you look at the battle rifle in Halo, and you look at the rifles that the people are using in District 9, it's the same exact model, just spray-painted white. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's something so I've that's never where, noticed, but yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so a couple of my guys, uh, like Joe... State and the writer were like just because some of the germs of ideas that they were kicking around uh, for for the for the game that they might have been making was very close to what District Nine ended up being. The idea of an alien that had weapons that were biologically attached to them and being infected and becoming an alien. That whole thing was part of this the concepts that they were kicking around. So I, I'm glad to see it happen, but I know Joe was like, "Oh, he could he could barely watch District 9 because he he felt like, like they've he, taken all that might have stuff. been." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't. I don't think he thought as much that they were like anybody was stealing anything or taking anything as much as he wished. You know, it had gone the way it was. Hope we were all hoping it would go. So. I but suppose, I thought District 9 was a great film. I just oh, I, I think it's a great 9. film too. So yeah, it's probably, yeah. I suppose the way you could spin it is District 9 wouldn't have been as good maybe. Absolutely. If, if yeah, it wasn't well, for the Halo prep? Uh, I th yes, I think you could say that. You could yeah. say that. I, mean, I don't know if Neil would agree with that, but I, no, I think Neil <laughs> would definitely uh, not, not so much admit to it, but just say, yeah, that was all part of the creative process. It's sort of like there's this big pool of stuff that happened and out of it came district nine but there was some halo people and bungee people involved in the the early stages of some of that stuff so so given how much you were kind of involved with halo and knew the backstory when you watched district nine could you immerse yourself in it or were you pointing out like oh i remember that this is halo <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> actually joe i think joe staten was more than i was because i didn't know all the things that they i didn't know how far some of that stuff had gone. So I was able to immerse myself in it and thought it was great. Right. It was just, just a great, unique sci-fi. I love the, the, the sort of hero of the story was this anti-hero guy that, was he a South African actor? Yeah, I think? yeah, South African yeah. actor, yeah. And, you know, just the kind of person you would never think of casting. Um, 
and he just became so such a tragic, likable figure. I just thought it was great. So, yeah, I, I was able to immerse myself. Uh, other than the fact I would I would be able to pick out some of the props as being like, oh, that's one of our that's one of the ones that uh, you know what a film whatever they are what a design made and we saw looking like Halo stuff, and then it was like, okay, now it's white, so it yeah. can be used in a different place. We had just opened uh, a museum in Auckland City. I actually haven't been yet, but I'm wondering if there might be some Halo stuff at the museum. So I'll have to have a look. Uh, yeah, I know they built a full-size Warthog, which is really big, and actually is four-wheel four wheel drive with four susp- – uh, you know, four-way steering, like all four wheels will steer, mm. uh, which was apparently, according to one of our guys who actually got to drive it, made it really difficult to control because, like, you would turn and it would turn really quickly because of the four wheels. And I think he clipped one of the buildings with the Warthog, so that was pretty <laughs> funny. Uh, but I think they might have sent the Warthog over here. I think it might be sitting in the States someplace. Right. So a lot of the, I think Microsoft, maybe I, probably, probably with Microsoft. Certainly. Um, I mean, Microsoft at the end of the day, Microsoft paid for all that stuff. Of so course, yeah. I think there are some of the helmets and weapons and stuff is in a little museum here in Redmond, Washington, mm. but I wouldn't be surprised if there's still some stuff in Auckland. That'd be cool. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how's your relationship now with the Bungie and Microsoft? Are you guys on speaking terms at all or is it just like, nah? I'm on speaking terms with individuals at right. both places, but, the company but officially itself. the companies themselves there. Uh, I don't think either company is super happy with me and I'm not super happy with the other, either company. But, you know, companies are certain, you know, corporations are sort of impersonal and strange and they have, you know, there's legal things that go on and you got to sort of fight for your rights and stuff. So um, that's just as an ongoing pain. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I don't have any like sort of official relationship with either company, but I still know individuals at both places and I'm still friends with people at both companies. So right, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, under any circumstance would, if, if the situation arose, would you be open to going back and maybe scoring for like another Halo film or you kind of feel like that part of your life you're finished with and you're done with and you're not really I think to be, interested. to be realistic, it's probably that part is over, but mm. I will never say never. And yeah. if somebody were to come to me and say, hey, we've got this idea, would you consider working on this thing or helping with this thing? from either company i think i would certainly be open to it so yeah. you never know it, different people change you know the thing about companies is the people in the companies actually get swapped out <laughs> sometimes they go somebody who you had a problem with politically or didn't see eye to eye suddenly they're no longer there and somebody new comes in and they're like why are we having trouble with marty and i'm, I'm like i don't know it's not my problem why don't you come talk to me uh so i'm hoping I always have hope for the future that something yeah. like that could happen with either company. Well, it's amazing how one individual or just a few individuals can influence the entire culture of an entire corporate structure, really. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. it really can. Yeah. Yeah. No, matter, no matter how big it gets. I mean, I remember even meeting Bill Gates uh, at, at Microsoft and there's no doubt in my mind that Bill the personality that Bill had influenced from the top down just about everything at Microsoft. And Bill is not an individually, um, I have to be careful how I say this because I, I, I really like Bill. Um, I got along with him. He was a cool guy. But I don't think he, I mean, he's a gambler. He's a brilliant businessman and a genius engineer, programmer, software guy, and also incredibly well-read. But he's not sort of naturally creative. I don't think Bill, like Bill doesn't understand at its core level what it's like to just sit down and write music or paint a picture. Um, 
I just don't think that's who Bill is. So he struggled with understanding that about people, which meant that I feel like the entire company of Microsoft right. struggled with that. Whereas Steve Jobs at, at Apple, I think he was more of a, he also had all of those cool business and software concepts, but he was as an individual, he could be creative on a very individual level. So I think he had a, a different understanding and appreciation of individual creative people. And that's why Apple sort of reflects that and Microsoft reflects that. So yeah. here, in my opinion, you have two giant corporations, each whose legacy sort of re uh, reflects that sort of core fundamental personality of each of the leaders, Bill Gates and, and uh, Steve Jobs. That's, you know, that's my theory. That's what I saw. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, I find with geniuses, right, because they're geniuses, there's certain aspects maybe of the human psyche or uh, understanding people on a fundamental level becomes a bit more difficult because they just think in a different way usually. Yeah. 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 You, can't, you can't have everything, right? No, no. I, no, no. Actually, <laughs> I think you're right. I think, uh with, you know, great power comes great responsibility. I think with genius, if you have like this huge wad of genius, there's probably some deficit like that, that normal people don't have. But the genius is here, but they have this deficit that you might not see for a while. But the deficits could be really great. So I think, you know, everybody's got deficits. But if you if you've got a really enhanced part of your talent and personality, there's probably a, a pretty big deficit someplace mm. so what's what's on the horizon for you what are you currently working on and what's well, the plan for the future there were a few uh especially this one of my favorite designers at bungie uh jamie griesmer uh sort of he had left bungie a couple years before i had um under slightly similar circumstances he had sort of ticked off some of the leadership and had some fights. And anyway, he was gone, but I stayed friends with him and he was, had been doing, um, he was a sucker punch and he did infamous second son, infamous two second son. Mm. And he had just about the time I was fired, he had just left sucker punch and he's like, Hey Marty, let's start a business together. Let's do a game development company. So, we we found another guy named Jared Noftel, who is a tech director, who's a programmer, and the three of us started Highwire Games. Highway, yeah. And and we did uh, our first title was was a uh, VR title for the PSVR called Golem. Golem, yeah. That came out a year ago, and then we've since also been working on a a new title, which hopefully we'll be announcing. We're, our plan is to announce it sometime this month. So uh, it's a new title. It's not VR. I think uh, I think it's going to be pretty exciting for people when they see what this is that we've been working on now. We've been working on it in secret for the last couple of years, which is sort of frustrating, but that's the way the game industry goes. You, It takes so long to do something, and if you're trying to do something new, you have to keep it quiet. And um, anyway, that's what we're working on. How do you so do we it? have How about 32 people in our studio, which is great, because one of the things we wanted is to let's keep the company small. You know, Jamie joined Bungie back in Chicago. Like I said, when we were in the 35 people or whatever. So he and yeah, I yeah. both have very fond memories of what it's to like, what it's like to work on, you know, substantial projects, but with a relatively small team. So we wanted right. to see if we could get back to that. So that's what's what we're doing. That's cool. Was, um, was there any, inspiration by lord of the rings when you came up with the name golem <laughs> <laughs> or is that just you know a actually not although uh 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 what's his name uh, uh tolkien's estate did call us and say hey oh, really? you know yeah you, you know what's the deal on this and we're like no this is this is golem which is a an ancient jewish you know mythical it's a hebrew mythical creature that's you know uh, been around for centuries. So the, the golem is a thing. And in Lord of the Rings, it's golem spelled differently, pronounced mm. differently. So we just said, Hey, this is, we're, we're not doing anything thing. like that. So they were like, Oh, okay. As long as you're doing that and you're not doing something that's like golem, 
or Gollum, then we're fine. So that's, yeah, that's hilarious that they called you. Was that early on in the process? Like yeah, as soon yeah, as you, we, you know, once we had dropped the the name, we, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We, I think we dropped the trailer first, and then we were. You know, we were, you have to look into trademarks and copyrights and all that stuff. Of and, course. and you know, I, I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it was just somebody doing the due diligence of saying, okay, this is this came across their desk. What is this thing? And they contacted us, but it went away pretty fast, but it was kind of cool to get contacted by <laughs> Peter or uh, not Peter Jackson, but the uh, Tolkien's estate. Tolkien's estate. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the name Gollum is, is, I mean, not Gollum, but Gollum, the, the name is actually used in a few other things as well. I think there's a Pokemon mm-hmm. called Gollum as well. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. Did you get called by yep. Nintendo? No, 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 no. Okay, because it's, it's definitely, you know, it's like, you know, it's like any mythical creature. You, it's a mythical creature that's been around for centuries or thousands of years. You can't, you just because you're, you know, if you're using the name that everybody's used, it's in public domain. So you, you can't be, you don't have a problem with it. It still must be annoying though. Like if you think of a name, you have to go through so much of a process just to use that name, you know, because yeah, you don't want to get is. sued. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that should yeah, be the simplest part of the process right but yeah that is sounds like a mission it is it can be a big pain yeah everything you do uh you'd be surprised at the number of different things that you don't even think about well i mean i'm sure you do this podcast and i'm sure you've been you know you think you're using a piece of music that everybody is using and suddenly you find out like nope i can't use that or i you know anyway there's there's stuff so, yeah, well, I, I compose my own music, so I avoid that problem. And I try oh, not, excellent. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I don't use anyone's music because I don't want it to be pulled off Spotify or have <laughs> lawsuits or anything, you know. Well, uh, I would give you permission to use all of my music, except <laughs> I own very little of my own music. So that <laughs> well, yeah, this Microsoft is, pulls stuff and, yeah. Th- this is often the trouble, right? I mean, if I speak to yeah. a composer and they say, yeah, you can use my music, and I'm like, hmm, do you own all the rights? Am I going to get sued? Like. Yes, <laughs> because it, it's it, that's another process that's like quite complicated. Because even though you scored the music, you don't own it. A company right. owns it, which must be frustrating. I mean, do you get royalties for the Halo soundtracks? That's uh, you do. That, that's a very good question. Um, uh, we're supposed to get royalties for it, uh, but that means somebody has to keep track of it. So if suddenly people sort of forget to keep track of it the right way or businesses change hands in weird ways or people forget what the contract is, then we have to proactively go back and say, Hey, you know, we haven't seen a royalty statement in a while or we're not, you know, what's going on. So it's just a constant fight. I mean, I've, I have my own little YouTube channel and I'll put up, sort of like, here's the creation of one of the pieces maybe people like, and I'll, you know, I'll find some old files, MIDI files or early versions of something, and I'll put it together in a video and put it up on YouTube. And, you know, a lot of people really like it. Well, I got one of those takedown notices from the music publisher on, you know, that's controlled by Microsoft saying this has to be pulled. This is copyrighted stuff. So I, I was really what? shocked. Yeah. So I, and, and the funny part is it wasn't even, I wasn't even using like the final version. I was using my sketches and stuff that I had just worked out by myself on the piano and things like that. So there is a way you can, you know, defend that or, or dispute it. So I went and did the dispute. I just said, look, you know, look it up. This is ASCAP registered music. I'm registered as the composer. This is my music. This is my site. I'm the composer. And they came back and they said, okay, yeah, no problem. So I was ready, you know, I was ready for a fight. Like, are you really, are you kidding me? I can't show how I created my, the music that I created. You're you're, going to tell me I'm not allowed to do that. Like that's BS, but so far I've been okay. But I, you never know when something might come in and another takedown notice happens of something I wrote, which is Mm. hilarious. Yeah. I, I have watched some of the stuff on your channel and um, there oh, was good. a piece, there was a piece, uh, I mean, you showed some of your earlier stuff, like prior yeah. to, like when you first, like early, early demos, which is way yeah. different to, to, to now. And I think it's yeah. really cool that you showed that, like where you came from in terms of the, 
the kind of trajectory you went on in terms of how you composed and stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm at the age now where I, I, I feel like I don't have to prove myself anymore. I'm, my best days might be behind me, but I, I don't feel as uh, like I have to hide what my process is, or I, I don't have to feel embarrassed about stumbling around and playing melodies that are stupid. But if there's a little hint in that melody of something that I, you know, made something better out of later, I kind of like being able to show that because for younger composers, I want them to know that like, look, it doesn't just come out of somebody's head fully formed. You have to work at it. And, you know, sometimes your earliest ideas are not that great, but there might be a spark of something. So you should be encouraged to keep honing and crafting and, and going, going after things because that's where the good stuff comes from. It comes from something that maybe, maybe isn't that great at the beginning, but you just keep working on it until it gets better. So mm. I, I like being able to show that because I think a lot of times young composers just think, well, how can I ever sound like that? And they don't know the struggle that happened in between. So, yeah. And, and I mean, I don't, I, I do music as well, probably not on the level that you do, but like what I mean is um, there's been times where I've found myself doing that. And I think a lot of composers do that as we all, or I think it's even part of kind of like the human psyche in a way yeah. where we kind of put certain people on these pedestals, like they're deities or gods in a way. And you're, and you compare yourself to them and you don't think that they have any struggles or they, they, everything just fell into place for them. But I mean, I'm speaking to you and speaking to other composers, you know, they've spoken on, times where they have writer's block or they talk about their early days when they were composing and, and it, mm -hmm. it, it kind of humanizes it in a way. So part of the reason why I brought that up is I thought it was awesome that you did that. Cause oh, I think, well, I, yeah. Cause I think a lot of, I think a lot of com composers would be, you know, they're obviously inspired by you, but they'll end up comparing themselves or every, every track that they do will be compared to yours, so to speak. Mm -hmm. at the at the level that it is now as opposed to because obviously everyone's at different stages yeah and you know sometimes it's you have to know when to stop producing and when to stop when something's good enough uh, that's one of the good things about deadlines is that well you know now it's orchestrated we're going into the studio and doing the final version and then while you're in the studio you can say wow I don't think I should have doubled the trumpet sound with the first violin. So, hey, trumpets, lay out. You know, you can do things at the last minute and then you have the mix. But once it's done, you know, it's like that's what you did. And you can go back and look at it and say, yeah, I would do something different now. But at least it's out there. You, you can move forward. But, you know, everything has a stage. It, it has the, you know, inception where you're just – that's why I call it the series that I do on my YouTube channel – you know, here's the inception stage. This is like, this is when I first put my hands on the keyboard and thought I need to do something like this. And, and I'm just noodling around and something attracts my attention. And so I keep playing on that. And then of course it could turn into some famous thing, right? If, if it gets used or it's in a game or whatever, people can say, yeah, that's where that, that's that beautiful thing. Mm. But like, yeah, it started with this very simple noodling around um and so i don't know I, I, you know maybe most composers do the same exact thing other composers might have different ways of doing it this is my way of doing it so i thought well i'll share that with people and especially for younger composers maybe it will resonate with people who are you know maybe just getting started or maybe a little discouraged um to know that you, your initial ideas are not necessarily genius, but you can work on them until they become pretty cool. So, yeah. Well, I think it, I think it's great. Did you, uh, this will be my final question. Before That's right. Up, but, uh, <laughs> but how did you find meeting your own expectations or the expectations that fans put on the music for the games? Right. Because obviously the halo theme became very iconic was there a part of you that's like, oh my gosh, I've got to create something iconic with every game now. I've got to meet the uh, expectations by fans. You know, trying to trying to beat yeah. your own 
own record in a way. I mean, I talked to David Wise about his Donkey Kong soundtrack and yeah, that was iconic and people using that yeah. and then him trying to meet the standard as well. And it must be hard. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, they talk about catching lightning in a bottle. Um, you sort of just have to say, well, I'm not going to change the way I do things. And I'm going to try to not let the pressure of like, oh, that's the most iconic thing ever. Like you just like, <laughs> well, that's great. That's the one time that happened. Uh, I'm just going to keep crafting, you know, being a craftsman, being, being as artistic as I can, having as much integrity as I can. And if I never get another one of those iconic things, that's okay. I've had one or two and that's, that's cool. A, a lot of people don't get that. Um, but yeah, if that's sitting on your shoulder the whole time you're trying to write, like, is this iconic enough? It's like, it's just too much pressure. So I just don't even think about it, to be honest it's, with you. That, I just, that's good. Because I think yeah. some composers, and not even composers, I think anyone that's kind of created something that becomes iconic or goes viral or anything, then there's yeah, the yeah, pressure yeah, yeah. to try and do it again. I mean, I yeah. imagine Peter Jackson probably felt it with The Hobbit when he was trying to replicate, <laughs> replicate Lord of the Rings. You know, just... <laughs> It, just so much pressure involved. And it's like, well, do you change tact? Do you still do things the way you previously did it? Yeah. Because yeah. the expectations will be different now. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I've figured it out. I'm not saying that I, that that stuff doesn't influence me in some way, but the influence always seems to be somewhat negative. It seems like a downer to, <laughs> to, to constantly sort of question yourself. Like, is this, as big as it, you know, as that other thing. But I mean, if you look at like, like you were talking about viral videos um, or things that go viral, like there are, there are people who try to manufacture viral stuff and they, yeah, they kind right. of do things that are sort of like, you know, get a little bit of something, but the truly viral crazy, who would have thought that would blow up? There's all that, you can, it's almost impossible to duplicate that. You, you can't figure out the formula to make that happen that way. So, um, you know, I just feel like if I can try to stay true to the process that got me there the last time, that's the only way I'll ever have a chance of doing it again. Mm. But I shouldn't expect it. And I shouldn't judge what I'm doing based on, does this have the potential of being huge and being iconic? Like, I don't know. That's so many different things have to come together, you know, from, you know, Steve Jobs introducing something and Microsoft purchasing, purchasing us and us being the launch title for the Xbox. Like how much of the reason the Halo music is iconic is because of all those things rather than just the music itself. Like if you yes. just never played Halo and all you did is hear that music, you might've just said, uh, that's that's nice. That's interesting. That's kind of cool. Uh, that's a that's a good beat. You know, I could dance to it. Whatever you know, it just could have come and gone with nobody paying attention to it. So the reason it's iconic is way bigger than anything that I'm a, than I can even wrap my head around. But certainly, all those other things had to contribute to it, and you can't be in control of those things. So. I can only be in control yeah. of the music or the, the little game we're working on or the project we're doing. And if it blows up, great. If it doesn't blow up, then it wasn't meant to be. And mm. it's, if you get one or two of those, you know, just be thankful. Thankful yeah, that you right. got one. Yeah. That's, that's very, very valid. Do you have, do you have anybody in your inner circle though, that kind of helps you kind of stay focused and not get affected by all that stuff? Yeah. My wife. <laughs> Well, what's the, what's the saying behind every great man is a better wife or something like <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, a better wife is right. <laughs> yeah, happy wife, happy life. That's um, right. You know, sometimes I'll run ideas past my wife and, you know, I ran the Music of the Spheres idea, which was the thing I ended up working with Paul McCartney on. And, and I, ran, I had the initial idea for it and I ran it by Marcy and she was just like, Marty, that's really good. You need to do that. And that was super encouraging. But there are other times when, you know, she's sort of like, well, yeah, that's, that's okay. But, you know, have you just okay? About this? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why is so, it just okay? And then, you know, she keeps me grounded. Like, you know, 
in, in a lot of different ways. She's a, she's a, a marvelous musician in her own right. She's a choral conductor. She co- conducted some of the choral music in Halo and Halo 2. Um, so I really trust her judgment and she keeps me, she definitely keeps me grounded. No doubt about it. That's cool. Well, that's a yeah. brilliant place to wrap up with a good right. compliment to the wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, if anyone wants to follow all your stuff, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, well, highwiregames.com. Yep. Uh, but we don't spend a lot of time saying anything to anybody there. We've been under the radar for so long. But if they go to Martin O'Donnell YouTube channel uh, or Marty the Elder on Twitter, that's usually where they'll find out what I'm doing. And the Martin O'Donnell YouTube channel is where I, I put anything, uh, you know, anything that I think might be interesting, I, I put up there. So mm, mm. that's the best place. Cool. Well, hey, yeah. Marty, this has been amazing. Thank you so much well, for taking time out to do this. And I'm, I'm looking forward to visiting New Zealand someday because it just looks and f- seems like it would be such a great place to visit, I got to say vacation something yeah well let me know if you're down here i'll see if i can hook you up with some deals or free hotel That'd be great or yeah. okay cool <laughs> <laughs> i'll right. see what i can do pull a couple of strings maybe i don't know we don't actually okay, have cool. we, we're not really dealing with COVID here so everything's just kind of oh, normal excellent. yeah yeah because oh. the borders are closed so it's kind well, of well then it's, i might not be able to get in yeah well i mean <laughs> post COVID, post COVID. okay yeah. all right okay. cool All right. Well, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Follow Marty. He is the man. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Okay. And stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.